get through. Let's talk to Christopher Snowden, though, of course. He is the man uh, who is head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs, because by, th by far and away, the importance of VE Day will be very much um, threading its way through this show. We're also talking about where we are with the economy, where we are with COVID-19, where we are with the lockdown, uh, because there seemed to be a bit of confusion in the mass ranks of the press yesterday, just because some newspapers had suggested that you might be able to go and have a picnic uh, this weekend. It turns out that Dominic Raab said, well, you can't really have a picnic this weekend. Uh, just wait and see what happens next week. Chris, a very good morning to you. Morning. And a happy VE Day, too. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of the confusion uh, in, in the likes of Beth Rigby's mind because it didn't seem that obvious to me that suddenly something had changed on Thursday morning just because the newspapers had said so. No, the announcement was always going to be on Sunday evening and any changes are going to start on Monday. But I think the fact that the government was leaking this stuff to the press on Wednesday shows how much they are stalling for time. Yes. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that they are trying their very best to kind of somehow master the uh, the balance, the fine balancing act of not really telling anyone what to do, but kind of encouraging them to do things. Well, I'm not sure if they know what they're doing themselves, quite honestly. It seems to me that they don't know whether they're trying to suppress the virus altogether, as some countries have managed to do, or if they're still trying to flatten the curve. But if you look at their actions, they're all over the place. If we were trying to suppress the virus completely, we would close the airports, for example. And if we were still trying to flatten the curve and protect the NHS, we would have eased the lockdown off because the danger to the NHS passed weeks ago. Yes, it would certainly seem so. I think the problem with uh, what happened yesterday was that suddenly, uh, despite the fact that things were looking pretty good and they were reporting this R uh, factor of being somewhere between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9, thereby making it obvious that the... The, the virus spreading was kind of on the way, and it then went back up again. And I think that sort of caught them on the hop. Well, indeed, if, it, if indeed it did go up again, it's a difficult thing to measure um, very precisely, I, as I understand. Um, but I, the, the, the way in which the government has moved the goalposts on this, I think, should be profoundly disturbing to anybody who's interested in civil liberties. You know, Boris's Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson's speech today about VE Day, you know, was very good, and obviously VE Day is extremely important, but he said that we wouldn't be free today were it not for what happened in the Second World War. Well, I'm afraid we're not free today. We've never, literally never been less free than we are today. Do you really think that? Well, when else in history have all the churches and pubs been closed? When else in history... Yeah, but I mean, you know, you can probably live with a pub oh. being shut for a few weeks, and if you can't go to church, that shouldn't bother you. You can worship in private, can't you? Yeah, but nevertheless, we have never had more restrictions on our freedom of movement, what we can do, freedom of businesses to open, even in wartime. Yeah, but I mean, the fact is, is uh, looking back at what happened in, during wartime, I don't think you can even compare the two. In fact, it's kind of almost insulting. I'm just watching the red arrows flying past, by the way. I mean, just imagine if I was sitting here during the war uh, and what was flying up the Thames was not actually the red arrows, but it was the Luftwaffe dropping bombs on St Paul's. I mean, you know, it's not really comparable. And I think no, no, to do I'm that is saying, kind I'm of almost an insult. That. I, I'm not in any way suggesting that we're in a worse situation today than people were during the Second World War. That's not my point. The point is, it's ironic for Boris Johnson to talk about our freedom today when we have never been less free, and when we've never been less free. Yeah, but I'm dis disagreeing with you, Christopher. I don't believe that we're less free. You know, I came out of my house this morning, I got in my car, I drove to work, uh, I had some breakfast, I shall be driving back to my car uh, to the supermarket to do my weekly shop, where I'll be able to buy as much wine, uh, as much steak, and as much uh, many courgettes as I like. I do not recognise myself as not being free. Well, that's because you are, as a journalist, one of the few key workers. There's lots of people working. There is lots of people working, because they're key workers, but there's a lot of people who aren't working. A lot of people, are, indeed... Yeah, many of them being paid by the government to do nothing. I mean, well, indeed, they are, yeah, which is one of the reasons... Well, it's hardly not being free, though, is it? It's, you're not free if you are not allowed to have more than two people gather in public. You're not free... That's nonsense. You have to have one of a very small well, number when, of... Well, when was the last time you weren't able to, to talk to people? When have we... OK, when have we been less free than we are now? I can't imagine that we are less... I mean, I don't... I, I can imagine being less free when I worked in former Yugoslavia once, when I couldn't go out at night without being stopped by the police. That doesn't oh, yeah, happen. But... Yeah, well, that was in Yugoslavia. I'm talking about Britain. Well, I haven't... Let's not, I, I, let's I, not go well, off too much on, uh, down this... Well, I just think it's a nonsensical thing to keep saying that we've never been less free. It's absolute cobblers. Well, I mean, look at the, look at the legislation. You know, there has been no time in history when the government has forced people into their homes solidly for weeks, indefinitely, changing the reason... Do you know why. anyone who has been stuck in closing their home for weeks? Closing all the churches, closing all the pubs, closing most businesses... 
and saying that if you want to leave the house at all, it has to be for a very restricted number of specific reasons. Yes, but the point about that is that they have to make these rules in order to let people relax and break them, because how many people have you seen out on the streets where you live? You've probably seen quite a few, I would imagine. You've probably seen people walking around, you've seen people shopping, cycling, running. You know, to categorise it as not free, I think, is entirely wrong. Well, the, the very fact that it could be illegal for people to be walking and cycling... But it's I not, though. That we're, ...we're rather living in a bit of... Uh, you know, under martial law. Yeah, but that's nonsense. I mean, I'm sorry that well, we have to, uh, go, we have to go on about it. Up. If you've ever been in a place where they have martial law, you wouldn't even say that. Well, I haven't, because I live in Britain. That's my point, is we don't, we don't have martial law. We haven't had this kind of thing before. We haven't had the police taping up benches and hassling sunbathers, because we have traditionally been a free country. We are currently not a free country. I understand the reasons why that is, why we had to have a lockdown initially. Unfortunately, however, the government is now moving the goalposts and has gone from a position of saying we're going to flatten the curve, but we accept that people are going to get this. Well, would you accept this, that it's the scientists that are moving the goalposts, not the government? No, I don't accept that, actually. No, I, I, I think that the, for, for most of this crisis, the government has followed the same strategy. So the scientific evidence from time to time has changed. Niels Ferguson's um, predictions clearly were more alarming than what they were previously working on. But there was always... I think less said about that. Neil Ferguson, the better, to be honest. Well, yeah, uh, indeed, he's, he's not very popular. He's not, he's not exactly but, painted himself in glory. But, but the, the basic strategy throughout, despite people talking about a U-turn back in March, actually, I think the basic strategy until very recently, was the same. It was an acceptance that people are going to get this disease, an acceptance that it only kills a very small minority of people, that it can't be contained, and so we just need to manage it, but we can't expect to suppress it. Now the government seems to think it can suppress it, while at the same time not actually doing the things that are needed to even attempt to eradicate it, like closing the airports, getting people to wear face masks, getting this contact tracing technology working. It seems to me the primary reason we're going to be stuck indoors for another three weeks is because the government has failed on contact tracing. But the only places where closing airports has actually worked, really, is, is Australia and New Zealand. And uh, in terms of New Zealand, which is probably the gold standard for that, um, very few people actually go there. I think the argument about closing the airports down here was that there was already uh, the, the virus was already spreading, and in most places where they did shut airports, like in the United States of America, uh, it was already spreading like wildfire anyway. So I think the argument, and I'm not making it for them, but the argument they were making was that it won't make any difference. Well, I think that's probably right. I, I, th I don't think we can eradicate the virus. I agree with you. There are other countries, actually, like Taiwan and Hong Kong and Iceland, who have managed to eradicate it. And, and have yeah, but these are all very different places where not very many I, people go. I mean, London I, is the centre of, of, of world I, travel, basically. I, I, I totally agree. I don't think that eradication is a realistic possibility. No. But if it's not a realistic possibility, we should be easing the lockdown, because the original objective of the lockdown has been accomplished. Yes, I think that's right. But I think, as I say, they have to play this kind of slightly curious game where they say one thing uh, and they watch something else happening. You know, there's no question in my mind that there's an awful lot of people out there and about. And this weekend, we bank holiday weekend, you mark my words, you live down on the south coast, there will be loads of people wandering about in the sunshine, there will be loads of people having picnics, there will be loads of people doing the things that the government have said they shouldn't be doing, because if the government says you can do it, it then becomes an even bigger problem because more people do it and more people do it with less care if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, but I think the government should be straight with people. I don't really agree with the idea. That we've had a lot of noble lies throughout this crisis. We take face masks, for example. We're told that they don't work. Eventually, they're going to say that we have to wear them, or certainly we should be recommended to wear them. Um, well, it, they haven't done that yet, and they've had a good two weeks to come, no, to come up with a reason for us to say, to, to say make sure stuff. you wear them. They haven't, got, they haven't got the face masks. Once country, if you look around the world with the, how the advice has changed on face masks, they all say initially, the governments, face masks don't work, don't bother with them, we need them in, in our hospitals. Then when they get enough face masks for the general public to be able to buy them and wear them, they, go, they turn on a sixpence and say, actually, the, the, in some places, they said it has to be... Uh, mandatory. Yeah, I don't know if that <laughs> point will ever come, but what they have said is it's a good idea to cover your mouth if you're going into a public place like a supermarket or like the underground. Yeah, they have. Which but is probably public, which is probably like, true. I, I think it's absolutely true. I think face masks certainly work, certainly if you've got enough people wearing them. But that hasn't been the message from our government yet because they simply haven't got the face masks. They no, but I, think, I also think they don't actually want to tell people in absolute specifics what to do. I think Boris Johnson's been quite careful not to order people to do specific things, you know. To say to people you should only go out if you absolutely have to is not the same as saying don't go out, is it? Uh, well, no, you can go out to go shopping and go to work. That's what I mean. But if they said don't go out, otherwise, you know, you risk being fined, 
that would be a very different message, and they don't want to give that message. Well, you, you, people have been fined for going out if they haven't got a reasonable excuse. Obviously, they, they have to let people go shopping, and they'll have to let some people go to work. Well, people have been fined for dragging caravans down to Cornwall, which is entirely right, in my view, because if you're told not to travel very far, uh, if you want to go and do some exercising or walk the dog, you shouldn't be getting in a car and towing a caravan a couple of hundred miles to go on holiday. Well, I would agree with you, yeah, but the people have also been fined for sunbathing. And yeah, the, the, the risk of infection outdoors, as I understand it, is actually very minimal. The government expected people to be breaching these laws a lot more than we have. It's interesting, actually, when you consider what Neil Ferguson's been up to this week. Um, you know, if, if, if he was one of the people who was giving the government advice on this, as he clearly was, mm. and he was, telling people, he was telling the government that look, people aren't going to take these laws that seriously, and actually people took them a lot more seriously and abided by them a lot more than they thought. Yeah. It perhaps suggests something about, you know, Neil Ferguson was thinking, well, what would I do in this situation? Yes, exactly I right. What he would do. So, well, yeah. well, now we now know what you would do, but I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. another question. I mean, the thing about Ferguson, right, is he's had two estimates, he's had two goes at it, both of them have been wrong. So, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would question why the government even went to him in the first place, given his history with mad cow disease and various other problems that he's come up with. Yeah, his track record has been pr pretty woeful. Yeah. I, as I understand, there was a kind of competition between Imperial College and Oxford University as to who would be the you know, primary modeler on this. Mm. And if you've heard from Carl Hennigan over the last few weeks, you'll see that Ferguson and he have a totally different view almost as big as the difference between Sweden and the UK. Yes, and that is the difficulty with following the science, isn't it? Because the scientists don't agree. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, all these decisions ultimately are political, but I do think certainly in the early days the government was following its specific scientific advisers. I, I really do think that the government had no, you know, it, it accepted that it, it, the politicians didn't know the answer to this, and so it took people like Neil Ferguson very, very seriously. But I think we've had, we have enough evidence now from around the rest of the world to see what works and what doesn't work, and we can start making you know, more informed political decisions based on real-world evidence. Yeah, I mean, what would, you like, what would you have them do, given that if you were given the opportunity to tell the government what they should do immediately, what would you have, what would you have them do? Well, they, they should be allowing people to gather outdoors, um, up to a point, I mean, maybe there should be some kind of limit on, on numbers. They should be allowing people to go around to one another's houses uh, within reason, and they should be opening primary schools, and then probably a number of businesses, things like garden centres. Yeah, and I think that that's the route that they were taking uh, when those papers came out on Thursday morning, and I think that that will be the route that they still take, and I would still expect Boris Johnson to announce one or two things like that on yeah. Sunday night, because... Clearly, the economy now is, is the front and, and centre of the argument, and they need to get it back uh, running again. I hope you're right. Uh, the, the leaks that came out on, on Wednesday night actually didn't suggest that. The main thing that was actually specifically mentioned was the possibility that garden centres might open and the possibility the government might allow people to do two forms of exercise a day, which actually wasn't illegal previously anyway. So I hope you're right about that. I suspect that there won't be much in it, actually. I think the government is stalling for time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, it's waiting for this contract tracing technology to get yes. going. I think, and I think that's also fair enough, because they can't afford to have a second peak. The first peak was pretty bad, but it was manageable, um, but the second peak might not be so manageable, and I think they have to be very wary of that, and we've certainly seen that in Germany they're watching the, the infection rate because they've opened things up a little bit more, and every time you look at another country, it's impossible to say whether they did it better or, or not, really, because it's not over yet. No, of course, we are in it for the long haul. I kind of disagree a bit about the second wave. I think we now know um, more or less at well, what point you have to go in lockdown to avoid the NHS being overwhelmed. Mm. And I think also as you get more people who have immunity, it, it would spread less quickly anyway. But I think the government is always going to err on the side of caution now. Um, I think it's really an act of political cowardice. You know, the, the, the softest, easiest thing to avoid the hysterics from people like Piers Morgan is just to keep the lockdown in place and just disregard all the human cost and the economic damage that goes with it. I think it's very likely now that we're at the point where the lockdown is killing more people than it's saving. Um, but it's the easiest option for the government to say another three weeks of lockdown, another three weeks of lockdown.